The Characters of Easter podcast with Dan Darling is brought to you by the Life Audio Podcast Network and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. Well, hello and welcome to the Characters of Easter podcast. I am Dan Darling, a pastor, author, and senior VP at NRB, the National Religious Broadcasters. And this is a special project with Life Audio uh, to feature some of the characters in the Easter story. Uh, This is based on my new book, The Characters of Easter, which is releasing this season from Moody Press. You can go to danieldarling.com slash Easter. We have all kinds of free downloads available for you if you want to do this with your group or with your church. Uh, Hopefully, uh, this could be a guide as you're making your way through the Lenten season and shifting your attention to uh, the passion of Christ, to the events surrounding the the arrest and the death, and of course the resurrection of the Son of God. Uh, This for Christians is everything. This is what our whole faith is based on. As Paul would say, uh, if this is not true, the resurrection is not true, then it is religious people, it is Christians who are of all men, of all people, most to be pitied. Well, today I want to focus on one of my favorite characters in the Easter story, and that is John. Now, Jesus, in his ministry, had many disciples, hundreds, maybe thousands of disciples, people who left everything to follow Jesus, who were devoted to Jesus. Obviously, the disciples were uh, different than the crowds who followed them. They're There were the crowds and there were the disciples who were truly committed, who said they would take up the cross and follow him. But then he also had, even he had his disciples, but then he had a group of 12 who were kind of his his key people in the movement. Uh, The 12, as we call them, 12 disciples, 12, uh, 11 became apostles, except for Judas, uh, and are kind of the foundation of the church But then even among those 12, he had three that were his closest friends. Uh, Like most of us, Jesus, being a human being, had acquaintances, he had friends, and then he had really treasured close friends, and that would be Peter, James, and John. Uh, James and John being brothers, the sons of Zebedee, and Simon Peter, and Andrew were brothers as well. But Peter, James, and John, they went with him everywhere. They went to the Mount of Transfiguration, they were at some of the key events that even some of the other disciples were not there for. Now, we talked a little bit when we talked about Peter about life on the shores of Galilee, life uh, in uh, Capernaum, where uh, Peter joined the fishing collective of James and John and were part of that business. Now, James and John were sons of Zebedee. Zebedee and Salome were the parents. They owned this this fishing business James and John worked for. This is a very comfortable lifestyle, a very good middle-class lifestyle. This is a, um, uh, fishing was a good trade. Uh, Capernaum was the main port, uh, the main busy port on the shores of Galilee. And they would catch fish there, uh, commercial fishing. This is not like uh, sport fishing like you would think, like fly fishing or getting our rod and reel, going a boat on a Saturday. Uh, this was serious work. This throwing your nets into the sea, bringing them in, hoping to get a good amount of fish, cleaning your nets, uh, doing business, selling your ware, your, your fish uh, in the local markets for local sale, but also to be uh, exported and distributed uh, across over into the Mediterranean and then really shipped around the Roman Empire. Fish was a, was a delicacy there. So this was a good living that they had. Uh, John is an interesting person. He wrote most, most of the New Testament. You think he wrote Revelation. He wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He wrote the Gospel of John. Uh, he uh, was a very instrumental figure. I want to read this from Martin Luther about uh, the Gospel of John. He says this. This is the unique, tender, genuine, chief gospel. Should a tyrant succeed in destroying the Holy Scriptures, and only a single copy of the Epistle to the Romans and the Gospel, according to John, escape him, Christianity would be saved. Uh, 
One of the key verses when I think of John is 1 John 4, 7, when he says, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, the trajectory of John's life is pretty interesting. Um, Jesus first meets them in Capernaum. Now, just like Peter, it's probably likely they interacted, did business in the markets uh, together. They interacted in the, as I said, in the synagogues. Now, James and John were disciples of John the Baptist initially. They had followed John the Baptist. John the Baptist had pointed the way to Jesus. You know, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. But then there was a call on their life. Jesus is pursuing them as his disciples. And it, like we saw with Peter, this was a uh, a call that was not a one-time thing, but it took a series of, of calls. And, of course, the most poignant one is where Jesus says, and this is recorded in the Gospels, he, he appears on the beach and he says to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This is a significant thing. They have a very well-to-do business. Not rich, but they're making a good living, a good lifestyle. They're young men. Their whole lives are ahead of them. Um, their family's there in Capernaum. And yet the, the Bible recorded, records that they left their nets and they followed Jesus. They left their nets and they followed Jesus. One of the Gospels records, actually, uh, they left their nets with Zebedee, with the father. There's a lot here. One, it means they were willing to sacrifice their future, a very sure future for the call of God upon their lives. They didn't know everything it would bring. They didn't get the whole New Testament like we do. They didn't know what those three years would mean. They didn't know they would see Jesus die, be unjustly arrested and executed. They didn't know that there'd be this whole church age. Of course, Jesus had prophesied this, and he'd, he'd kind of told them this. And you know, the prophets, if you look in the Old Testament, there's hints and, and prophecies of all this, but they couldn't put all, all that together. But they knew, but they knew enough to follow Jesus and took that huge step of faith to follow Jesus. John did this, gave up his career, gave up everything. We also can commend John's father and mother. Families were very tight back then. To leave behind your parents, to not carry on the family business, was a significant step that obviously Zebedee approved of. Now, what a word for parents. You know, I'm a parent uh, myself. We have four children, and there are things that, ideas and, and things that I'd like my kids to be. But God may have a call in their life that is completely different. Am I willing to not only relinquish that, but encourage that? We see Zebedee and Salome appear later in the Gospels. So... Clearly, they were supportive. So there's, there's many moments in John's life we could, we could point out. Um, we could think, you know, him being there for all these key miracles, the feeding of the thousands of people twice, the walking on the water, um, the healing of the lame, making Lazarus rise from the dead. But a couple, the interesting thing about his life that I think that takes a trajectory we know John as kind of the apostle of love. Uh, his books, uh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, talk a lot about love. And yet, when he's first with Jesus in those young days, he was not known for his love. In fact, Jesus gave him and James a nickname. He called them the Sons of Thunder. Now, typically when Jesus renamed someone, it was uh, in a positive sense, looking forward to what he called them to be. So when he says to Peter, Simon, thou art Peter, thou art the rock. Uh, upon this rock I'll build my church. He's, he's looking forward to what Peter would be, a pillar of the church. When he named James and John sons of thunder, well, that was a pejorative. That was negative. Uh, what it means is that they were people who had fiery tempers. And there's a couple instances we see this. There's one instance where John is asking Jesus to call down fire on the Samaritans. They're not responding to the, to the witness of the gospel. Samaritans are sort of the, the, the sort of enemy of Israel. And Jesus is calling, asking, G John knows clearly Jesus' power, right? He, he, he understands that Jesus is the Son of God. He knows from reading the Old Testament that God could call down fire on his enemies. He's, he's probably thinking in his, in his mind the story of, 
Elijah and the prophets of Baal on the Mount Carmel. And he's saying, we have this, he, he also knows that as one of Jesus' disciples, he too has some power. And he's, he's just wondering and saying, Jesus, let's just call down fire on these people. Let's just, let's just get rid of them. And of course, Jesus rebukes him for that. John, was, John had knew nothing about grace. He knew nothing about his own shortcomings. John didn't understand in the moment that as much as the Samaritans deserved God's wrath and judgment for their sin, so too did he. Of course, we'd see this in his later writings that Jesus had said that even the most righteous need salvation. It would be John who would record Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus, saying that even Nicodemus would need to uh, have his sins forgiven and needed a savior. There's another scenario where some other people are doing gospel ministry pointing people to Jesus, but it's not officially sanctioned by Jesus. And again, here's John saying, man, there's, a, there's, there's someone else stealing our market share. Uh, they're taking away um, ministry and people from us. There's a competitor. And Jesus rebukes him and says, uh, Who's not for, whoever's not for me is against me. And I'll have to tell you, this kind of attitude is still prevalent uh, 2,000 years later. And one of the things you, you know and hear about ministry and you experience is that quite often the people who are most difficult to deal with are people in your same kind of area of ministry who see you as a competitor. Competitor for donors, competitor for constituents, all of that. And pastors can get into this mentality too. We can see our church and the other churches as we're all competing. And Jesus is saying, no, the more gospel ministry, the better. So this was John. We think of Peter as being impetuous. We think of Peter as being off the cuff, and he could be. John and James actually were. They were ones who uh, quick triggers and fiery tempers and not much grace. Probably a little cocky, probably a little self-assured. They'd been chosen by Jesus to follow him. Another thing that we see that all the Gospels record is the disciples arguing about who's going to be greater in the kingdom of God. Again, these, these folks know that Jesus is the Son of God. They see his miraculous powers. They see that he fits the kingdom prophecies. Uh, but what they could not square in their mind was that Jesus would first suffer and die, that he first must go to the cross, and he must suffer and die and then rise again, and that he will come again on the, in the second advent in power, uh, reigning as fully as king. But they're jockeying for position. They're thinking... If, if uh, there's only 12 of us, and he Jesus leads a revolution, and I'm in the inner three, gosh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a pretty good position. So they're jockeying for position. Hey, you be Secretary of State, I'll be Vice President, or you be Secretary of Defense, and I'll, I'll be this. And they even enlisted their mother to ask Jesus about who would have what position, who's going to be on the right and who's going to be on the left. Now, a lot of people look at this passage that we see where they're, Salome, John and James' mother, asking Jesus for a good position for their son. We see this as an overbearing mother wanting to plan their children's future. And it may very well be that. But actually, if we read the other Gospels, the other Gospels say that John and James were talking about this. This seems to me like it was a big topic of conversation among the disciples, John and James particularly leading it and jockeying and edging out people. And I believe, now this is not dogmatic, but I do believe they probably enlisted their mom. Hey, mom, Jesus likes you. You're the mother. You can you you got an edge with him that maybe I don't. Would you mind just kind of asking and floating it out there to see how Jesus is going to set up his cabinet? Um, I mean, and what a what a move, right? What a power play move. And of course, Jesus' answer is. Uh, where, where I'm going, they can't go with me. In other words, there's, there's a place that I, Jesus had to go alone. The way to power was through weakness. The way to, uh, for, for them to be great in the kingdom of God was through weakness. But first it had to be through Jesus' own weakness. He had to be alone on the cross. He had to pay for their sins in order that they might, through the Spirit, have real spiritual strength and not power and position. I think it's interesting, though, the way that you see this play out in the Lord's Supper, the, uh, in that final meal that they had before Jesus would go into the garden and he, where he'd be arrested. Scripture records who's at Jesus' side. John is. 
John's at Jesus' side. And so, and he's at Jesus' side when Jesus is telling that he's going to go die, that he's going to be arrested, that he's going to be betrayed, that there's going to be suffering for his disciples, that if they hated Jesus, they would hate them, and yet that God was going to use them to start this new movement called the church. The truth is, James and John did get to be on the right and the left of Jesus, but it was not the right and the left in the sense that they thought. It wasn't in the sense of being in a cabinet position and having power and prestige, but it was being with Jesus in suffering, with Jesus in, in dying and having new life. Uh, that this is why Jesus says the greatness in the kingdom of God comes through weakness. And this is what, where I, th I think John, where his heart turned from being an, a son of thunder to an apostle of love. That the cocksure, impetuous person that had didn't have any time for anybody who disagreed with him, that he didn't have any grace for anybody else, started to see, okay, this is what the kingdom of God is like. And it's interesting, who do we see at the foot of the cross? Everyone's gone. Peter denied Jesus. The other disciples had left. You and I, by the way, would have left too, so let's not be too hard on them. We see John there, uh, the one whom Jesus loved. Uh, it's interesting, the language, the disciple whom Jesus loved, is only used in John's gospel. See, I don't think John is writing as if to say, I was Jesus' favorite when he says the disciple whom Jesus loved. I think he's writing personally saying, the only way I want to describe myself is someone who is loved by Jesus. That's the only way I see myself. And here's John at the foot of the cross. And Jesus, in his dying, gasping last breaths, asked John to do a, an important mission to take care of his mother. There's a lot of things we see here. One, we see Jesus, even as dying for the sins of the world, even the Son of God, still obeyed the command to honor father and mother and to make sure his mother was cared for. What a lesson this is for all of us men and women to care for the elderly populations. The other thing we see here is John's transformation. John went from being a son of thunder, wanting to call down fire on everybody, to the tender friend who would care for and be entrusted with the mother of Jesus. And of course, we see John then throughout the, the rest of the, the early church, the pillar of the early church. He writes 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He writes the Gospel of John, which is the, the Gospel that was written after the other Gospels. It's a kind of a complement to the other three. Uh, he's a leader in the early church. Then he is exiled to the Isle of Patmos, and there he writes uh, the Revelation. Uh, the book of the future, uh, God's word to the churches about staying strong through persecution, but that also there's this vision of the kingdom of God. Jesus comes again to rest renew and restore the world and set up his kingdom in the new Jerusalem. He's entrusted with that message. Um, John was the last surviving apostle. Every, all the rest of them were martyred. John lived to, to an old age, uh, exiled, of course, didn't, didn't stop his pen. God gave him the book of Revelation. What a great story. And I, and I think it's a lesson for all of us when we watch John that God takes us raw. He takes us untested. He takes us unqualified. You would not have looked at John, young John, and said, there's someone that's going to be an, a wise sage in the greatest movement in human history and one of the elder states of that movement. You wouldn't have said that. You'd have rolled your eyes and said, oh my gosh, this guy is just, doesn't get it. He's impetuous. He's hard to be with, hard to live with, a son of thunder. But he became an apostle of love. It shows that God is looking for people willing to follow him with all of their flaws and all of their mistakes and all of their weaknesses and turn them into people fit for use in his kingdom. What a great promise this Easter. I hope you have enjoyed this. I hope this encourages you as you think about Easter and you think about the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us today on the Characters of Easter podcast. If you're interested in the book, you can go to danieldarling.com slash Easter. 
And there are plenty of free downloads if you want to do this book as a group study or with your church. You can also purchase the book at any of your favorite retailers. Thank you for joining us today. The Characters of Easter podcast is a production of Life Audio and the Salem Web Network. We hope you'll also check out Dan Darling's book, The Characters of Easter, The Villains, Heroes, Cowards, and Crooks Who Witnessed History's Biggest Miracle. It's available from Moody Publishers on Amazon.com or wherever you buy your books. You can find more from Dan and all his latest books and podcasts by visiting DanielDarling.com. If you liked what you just listened to, would you just take a second and tell your friends about us? Maybe leave us a rating on your favorite podcast app? This podcast is produced by Kelly Givens and Stephen Sanders with editorial oversight provided by me, Stephen McGarvey. To find more great Christian podcasts like this, check out the rest of our shows at lifeaudio.com.